All right, guys. So today's the uh, last lecture, um, and then tomorrow I'm going to post the review for the final. So we're talking about body, Bonnie Steinbach's response to Peter Singer. Um, she's saying that Peter Singer made some very important contributions to remind us that animals deserve very special consideration, but he fails to make a compelling case against speciesism. Um, even though she basically accepts on the surface his basic premise that it's wrong to harm animals. Um, however, she says that um, there are special traits that human beings have that make us a special species uh, and give us a special moral status than other animals. Um, and she argues that this is very intuitive and it's widely held that there's something different about human beings. Uh, so the claim is not really, uh, she doesn't need, uh, kind of saying like she doesn't need to make like a, um, like a heavily evidenced argument, but she goes on to do so to a certain degree. Um, so she says like when, you know, when we decide that animals are going to be harmed for maybe the medical research for the purpose of human benefit, um, there's a necessary premise to that argument that humans are more important than non-human animals. Um, so the case of harm overrides the prima facie case not to hurt animals. So on the surface, it's good not to hurt animals, but if we have a really, really good reason, essentially, then we can harm them, i.e. medical research or even food. So we couldn't make that kind of argument, or Steinbeck couldn't make that kind of argument if people didn't have if humans didn't have a special status uh, to be a preferred species. So what are the special traits then that give human beings that preferred special status? One, um, and she's saying that this isn't like an exhaustive list, but these are the four most consistent. Um, she said that there are human beings are, are beings who are responsible for their acts and can do other than what they have done which is essentially that free will argument that we take responsibility because we make choices and we can make different choices. Uh, so uh, that sets human beings very far apart from other non-human animals, at least on the surface. If we examine it further, and I think it's slightly beyond the scope of this discussion, we can see that maybe there's not a, uh, as big of a difference as we'd like to believe between the way that we behave and uh, acting according to an essential nature than when compared to uh, non-human animals, but that's sort of the biological determinist argument, which sort of attacks the, the free will hypothesis, which is that we can pretty much choose anything we want at random. So, but we'll set that aside for now. But if we were to explore the biological determinist position uh, in depth, and there's a lot of empirical evidence to suggest that we are probably more determined than we are free, uh, it would it'd do some damage to this first argument that Steinbach is presenting in terms of what gives us a special status. But we're going to move on from that, but I urge you to explore that if you ever are interested in looking at the uh, existential free will versus biological determinist perspective, something that is uh, pretty interesting and kind of evolving in philosophy. Uh, second argument is that we're capable of uh, reciprocation and we can return favors and we can provide special treatment. So essentially saying that like we can um, do unto others, right? We can treat others the way that we want to be treated and we can do things for other people without any type of um, benefit to ourselves like altruism and so forth which is going to be the third argument, but that, that we can, we can reciprocate behavior. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's, I don't think we could necessarily say that animals don't do that. There's a really good article that I might uh, check out if I were you, if you're interested in this by a biologist named Dorothy Cheney, who writes, um, this is, I think 2011, but the extent and limits of cooperation in animals. And she details um, how other animals can basically behave in ways that are considered to be human insofar as it gives us that special status. Now, she's not 
addressing the Steinbach argument. It's not even really an ethical uh, argument at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a biological, it's a biology journal. And she's from, uh, she's a biology professor, but, um, but she's talking about how human beings can, or excuse me, non-humans can act in cooperative manners and, and goes to great lengths to identify some of the potential limitations. So I would recommend checking that out. But there's a lot of really interesting ways in which various animal species behave that sort of look similar to what Steinbach is talking about insofar as what makes us uniquely human. Now, there's so many different species and there's so many different uh, things that we could look at that it's, again, way beyond the scope of this particular discussion. But I would urge you to check that out. The, that, again, that's The Extent and Limits of Cooperation in Animals by Dorothy Cheney which I think is a really good uh, article, uh, academic piece. So the third one is animals are not capable of altruism. We are. That is acting on behalf, uh, as we know, to the benefit of somebody else, uh, even at our own expense. So putting the needs of others first and acting on that. That's the opposite of egoism, which is something we discussed at the beginning of the semester. Um, and the fourth one is people can be uh, appealed to with persuasion and reason. Now, this is probably the strongest uh, case that she's making. Um, all the other ones we see aspects of in the animal kingdom, altruism, reciprocity, and not necessarily taking responsibility, but some type of determinist, determinist behavior, if we were to look at the antithesis of that. But, but the being appealed to with reason. So, you know, obviously using language and logic. We can make arguments to change people's minds, to persuade them to look at things from different perspectives. Uh, and this is an important thing from an ethical standpoint. When we're looking at what makes us unique and what makes us different and what gives us a special moral status. It's that we can basically like make ethical arguments and we can reflect on past decisions and think about decisions that we might make in the future and change our behavior and maybe persuade others to change their behavior in an ethical way, which is, I think, quite uniquely human as far as we can understand. So I think that's probably the strongest argument that Steinbach makes. Um, and I think that's pretty much all we need to... Well, I mean, a few other things um, that Steinbach talks about. Um, she, she says that, you know, we shouldn't be arbitrarily hurting animals. We need a compelling reason. So she's claiming don't be cruel to animals. And she defines cruel as an infliction of necessary pain and suffering. So this is something that she's looking at again. And you can look at this as sort of utilitarian, and some might argue it's even more utilitarian than Peter Singer. It's just the application of the utilitarian formulation is only applying to humans, whereas Peter Singer is extending the utilitarian formulation to the entire sentient creation, which is going back to Jeremy Bentham. Uh, if you can suffer, then you have a right to to be protected from suffering. And there are obviously lots of animals that can suffer to varying degrees. So I think that wraps it up for our animal ethics, the Bonnie Steinbach response to Peter Singer. I think the Steinbach reading should help you understand the Singer reading a little bit better. And you can see a clear contrast between their perspectives. Bonnie Steinbach is saying there are other things about us. There are other qualities that give us a special moral status. Singer saying, it's all about suffering. If a being can suffer, they have a right to not be made to suffer. It can be, you know, simplified in that regard. So, all right. So we'll do the review for the final uh, next post.